played a role, and this is the interesting thing because we've talked about this, Churchill and violence, valiant in war, but then in peace, equally valiant and strong, and, and knowing when to make the switch. He is the, drives the British position. You can't give way to the IRA, and you can, rough methods have to be used. It's a dirty war, and you can only fight it by methods of a dirty war. And he faces up to this. He doesn't hide from this. He says we're doing, in effect, openly, he says we're doing terrible things. Um, and his propaganda against the IRA is terribly called to he, he, he says they're like the Human Leopard Society in East Africa who are cannibals. Now, whatever you say about the IRA, they weren't actually cannibals, but that's what Churchill calls them. Cannibals. So it's absolutely intense. And then when he thinks by enough application of dirty war against dirty war that they're going to compromise and they're not going to push for an Irish Republic, which is a humiliation to Britain, and they're not going to push to take over the Northern Ireland with a million people on a small island who were bitterly opposed to it. And in Churchill's view, that prospect meant a civil war ad infinitum, dragging in America, he would say. So when you get them to compromise on those two big things, um, and for Ireland to accept self-determination within the 26 counties of the 32 counties, and you meet Michael Collins, who does immediately, he's one of the very first people. He's in the minority in the cabinet, which suddenly says, now is the moment in May 1921. We've fought them hard enough, long enough. They now know we're not a pushover. Now we go for the deal. And he's way ahead of most of the people, including you know, people you would not expect in the cabinet, well-known liberals or, or soft-type, hawk, non-hawk-type people, dove-type people. So it's this thing where we well, fight, you really fight. And then you reach the point where you calculate, you can get a compromise, and you go for it. And he, he writes about this later on when he's writing about Michael Collins, who's the Irish leader he makes the deal with. And when he's talking to, about that, uh, he writes an article 10 years later recalling all this, recalls Collins' bravery in sticking to the deal because the deal with Churchill really cost Collins his life. And he, he, Churchill, clearly observant of all this, knows this. When he talks about it, he also talks about the mentality at the end of the war, and he recalls Castlereagh, who he is connected by family lineage, the greatest British, Ar British Foreign Secretary, Irish. And he recalls Castlereagh, and he says, after Napoleon is defeated, Castlereagh immediately says, that's it now, no more punishment of the French people. We've got to make the break. And he says, this is what you have to do, and the trouble, the difficulty is, at the end of war, at the end of conflict, it's the hardest struggle, he says, is with yourself. To say it's a new era, we make a break, but that's not. It's a brilliant essay about the treaty, in which he recalls this. And, the heart, and we heard yesterday about Germany, how all my bitterness about when I saw the rubble, all my bitterness against the German people left me. This is, what, this, is one of, this, is, this is a kind of a part of Churchill's broader international legacy, in which Ireland has played a big part in forming and flowing into the way he, the way he thinks about these things. So it's there all his life, and in the 30s, it's a kind of, as he's isolated, there's this bitterness in this essay, I did great work in this area, nobody cares, I'm isolated, but I'll tell you anyway, that I, I was really heavily involved in this stuff. When the war comes along, uh, 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 it, there, I've already just explained about how he disliked Irish neutrality and the reasons why he did, and there are real military reasons for disliking it intensely. There's no question in my mind. Um, it was perfectly reasonable to say that Ireland was so divided politically, Ireland could never have come in on Britain's side. That is a perfectly reasonable thing to say, that, that, that it would have been, and in fact, the tacit types of support, Irish people, like my mother from County Cork, who owned Churchill's army, was a doctor, in, 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 uh, who were able to join up easily, could not have done, the, no, the deal wasn't a bad deal, for lots of Irish workers went to England and played a major role in wartime production. So it's perfectly reasonable to say it's the best thing that could happen, and that really, given the divisions in Irish society, which Britain is at least partly responsible for, you can't do better than that. But there is equally no doubt that thousands of British sailors died because the decision was made by Chamberlain in 1938 to actually rewrite Churchill's deal with Collins and give back the treaty ports, the naval facilities that, Ireland had, that, that Britain had in, 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 in Ireland. And there's no question, and Churchill bitterly, bitterly denounced it. Everything he says about that deal was uh, justified. By the way, Chamberlain, what's he motivated by? I want to send a signal to the Germans. My signal is George Jaws better than World War. I, my signal is, we, we want a new, European newspaper saying, the British have an 800-year-old quarrel with Ireland, 
uh, and they're doing peace deals with Ireland. Let's do peace deals everywhere. Let's not have a war. That's a big part of Chamberlain's calculation, which Churchill could see as bogus and not likely to work. Um, but th th this is uh, uh, the, the key thing. But even with, even with, and I'll bring this to an end now, it's a lot of time for questions, but even with de Valera, who was the Irish leader he hated the most, because he regarded him as having undone Churchill's deal with Collins, quite correctly, accurately assessment by Churchill. In 1953, and uh, Lady Williams was here, uh, was kind enough to tell me she was there, when Churchill had saw, met de Valera, and there was a, 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 a friendly meeting in 1953 in Downing Street. And even with de Valera, there was a certain type of low-key uh, uh, re reconciliation. So always with Ireland, there's this emotional engagement, always a massive respect for Irish soldiers. Um, this is why he talks in the victory about the Irish VCs, one of whom, ironically, John Connett, is, is actually English, because what this chap had done, he was an English tearaway, who, who at one point left the army, uh, uh, um, um, deserted effectively, then wanted to rejoin, and took an Irish labourer's papers and rejoined as Keneally, and then one of the Victoria Cross. So Churchill thought he was doing, a, was making a great gesture. They actually were talking about the wonderfully brave Keneally, but actually this guy's name was, was Leslie Robinson. He was from Bradford. <laughs> and, um, so there's a, you know, but, but that's that's that in that case Churchill wasn't accurate. But as you all know, all the leading generals are Irish. Uh, um, the fighting Brooks. He rode into Ladysmith with uh, um, Al Al Alan Brook, Montgomery, all. So John Dill mentioned already at this conference, whose who's, who's grave is in Arlington Cemetery from Armagh. Churchill, this intense respect for Irish warlike capacities, intense respect for the literary capacities, and in the end, in 1948 or towards the end, the essay "The Dream," in which he engages with his father. And he has this thing, and that the dream is provoked by somebody sending him memorabilia from Belfast, which relates to his visits to Belfast and, and, and to his father's role in Belfast. And many people argue that Churchill was dancing on his father's grave because when Churchill went to Belfast in 1912, he was basically on the nationalist side, the moderate nationalist side. When he went, his father went in 1885, 86, he was on the unionist side. Um, and he was sent memorabilia about all this, and that's what the dream is about. The conversation is about, and his father talks about lots of things, world history, working with socialists in the cabinet and so on. But when you consider what a small place Ireland is, the amount of time given in the dream and the engagement with his father to Ireland, when you consider you know, all the massive issues that, that Churchill was engaged in, that shows you the importance emotionally that Ireland always had for Churchill. Just, just one more point in the dream. He also says, when he's discussing his relationship with socialists in the dream, his father comes back and says, you're in government with socialists in the war? And he says, well, they're a strange creed. They wear these tank tops, and they're very badly dressed. But actually, you wouldn't believe it. They, they, they're completely royalist, and they're not that difficult at all. Um, that's essentially what he says about the socialists. And just on, on the kind of um, Irish um, uh, Cromwell comparison, because it is a brutal counterinsurgency in the Anglo-Irish war, and he fights it with ferocity, um, and, and, and this kind of Cromwell comparison comes up later in the Second World War as to Churchill's military strategy. What Attlee says about that, I think, is also quite striking. He says, he compares him to Britain's various wartime leaders, and he says he is the most superior of all the wartime leaders in history, and Attlee says this in 43, and he's comparing him to, to different possible other alternatives. He says, well, you know, Cromwell was a better soldier, he says Marlborough, Marlborough was a better strategist, and Winston doesn't measure up to him. But if you compare to the wartime leaders, Pitt, William Pitt, in the, Napoleon, in the Napoleonic Wars and the French Revolutionary Wars, didn't really speak for England sufficiently. Lloyd George, while he was a very good wartime leader in the second portion of the First World War, failed on the grounds that he didn't have enough military knowledge to push back against the generals when they were making mistakes. And the difference is with Churchill, he combines the, 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 the understanding of the political optics of war with the sufficient knowledge of strategy um, and, and war fighting in itself. And what Attlee says of Churchill, which I think is, is very good before we open it up for questions, is a war leader in the democratic age must be more than a warrior. He must be a beacon for his country's will. 
And he says later on, Winston, you offered us blood, toil, sweat, and tears, and we glad you, gladly took your offer. So it's a kind of a, I, I suspect, a kind of a remarkable understanding of, of, of Winston's strength that it's too easy to sort of dismiss Atlee for, you know, being sycophantic or, or weak in that presence. But I think we have uh, time for some questions either on uh, the church or there's a gentleman at the back there. Yeah, I'm just, um, I think there's a, the mic coming. There's a room mic coming. So there's an apocryphal story of Michael Collins and Churchill meeting in the laboratory during the negotiations. Um, I heard Liam Neeson tell the story, so I, I don't know how true it is. But, um, and the other question I had is, um, I've read various conflicting accounts of Churchill's role in the creation of the black and tans. Um, and I wanted to see what, what the, the real story is. Um, I'm not so sure about Liam, Liam Neeson's story, but, but Collins and Churchill met a lot privately during this time. And they, um, you know, again, an example, by the way, the, of the importance of Ireland to Churchill is in terms of the painting, which everybody has talked about. It's Lady Lavery, it's Sir John Lavery the painter and Lady Lavery, at a certain point Churchill actually thinks, ah, I'm not really very good at this. And it's the Laveries who say, stick at it, stick at it. Um, which he, uh, you know, it was obviously a great relaxation for him and he's always grateful to them for making him stick at it. But he would meet Collins, for example, there at that house and Collins, and, 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 and there's a number of close intimate meetings. And there are a number of engagements in which Churchill probably said unwise Thing was so taken with Collins as a character, probably went too far in terms of the type of offers that he was prepared to make um, to Collins. Uh, in the end, it, it, it all stabilized for a variety of reasons. But there's no question, that in this sense, Liam Neeson is right. This is an, quite a, an intimate, emotionally connected relationship between those two men. Uh, on the um, uh, 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 on, on the, because Churchill knew he'd found somebody who was brave enough to make this compromise stick. Um, the, the, uh, on, on the, your, your other question about the black and tans, now I'm making this quite clear, I was trying to do it by shorthand. Churchill is behind the repression in Ireland. He, he tends over Tudor, he sends over Ormond Winter, and the argument is very simple, this is a dirty war. Organized baboonery is his phrase, but basically it's, it's not much classical military engagement. Some do occur during the War of Independence. It's shooting the local policeman as he walks down the street. This is basically the, the, the real color of the IRA war. And there is only one way of dealing with this by basically you deal with assassination by a policy of counter assassination. And he's totally frank about this. He says you cannot allow men there's 200 murders in Ireland at one point and nobody brought to justice, right? You cannot allow, men are not going to accept in, 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 in uniform or in the police that their commanding officer has been shot dead and they're going to say, that's just fine. Something's going to happen. So it's a, it, you may hate this, but this is what it's about. It's about dealing with dirty war by the means of a dirty war, but also promising. If you get it through your head, you've got to compromise. We're right, we're up for it straight away. Um, the deal's on, and, and, and constantly sending signals, which eventually Collins accepts. But I, I, there's no, I'm not putting a gilly -gil lily with this. Churchill stands over very brutal methods, and his defense would be, look what the IRA is actually doing, incredibly brutal, brutal war. And by the way, it's, you know, it's fairly surgical. What's quite interesting, British intelligence is not defeated by the IRA, and an awful lot of what despite the very heavy blow in November 1920, an awful lot of the assassinations are actually what we call today targeted and effective assassinations. And it's very, very, very important to understand this. But his hands are on, and he would not, if he was in this room now, he would, he would acknowledge this. Okay. Uh, Michael, yeah. Um, both of you are very distinguished historians, but you do <coughs> so much more. Lord Bew played a pivotal role 
in the Good Friday Agreement that brought peace to Ireland, and John is a prolific commentator in the New Statesman and elsewhere about foreign affairs. In some ways, you personify the mission of the International Churchill Society, and I wonder if you could comment on how your historical um, sense informs your engagement with current affairs. Well, I, I would say one thing about the Good Friday Agreement and Churchill's thing. The fundamental, and in this sense, and I was always aware, if you look at Churchill's historical and broad writings in Ireland, I've already said the part of is, is just brilliant. But in general, if you look at the historical sections of his books, when he looked at, they're very, very thoughtful. <coughs> very, very determined to be just to Irish causes, Irish emotions. They're very, very, very impressive. And he always stands for a principle, which is this, that actually the best outcome is a united Ireland closely linked to Britain, uh, a friend to Britain. If I can't have it, then the consent principle rules. And the consent principle means that the large minority in the northeast corner of the island or unionists and pro-British <coughs> should not have to come under an Irish government. Now, to be absolutely honest, that is the principle that wins out in the Good Friday Agreement, to put it very simply. And he's all for cooperation. All the um, uh, things that we agreed to in the Good Friday Agreement and North-South institutions, they're all modeled in the Churchill Collins Pacts. Ch Churchill, Craig and Collins met in, in London in March and, in, in, in January 1922. And if you want an easy kind of list of one of the areas that, all right, the island's divided, but there should be cooperation in certain policy areas, it's all there with Churchill. So. Churchill allows an easy answer to this. I honestly think it's perfectly clear and a, simple, and, and, and a logical argument to say that the type of historic compromise that we have in Ireland today, it's kind of rickety at the moment for a variety of reasons, but nonetheless has endured for almost 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement, reflects Churchill's thinking on the matter. And his deep you know, reading on the subject, he wrote to Stephen Gwynne, who was the the cleverest of the Irish nationalist MPs and the most intellectual said, send me a reading list, you know? So it's, it also reflects his engagement with, with, with Irish history. And I say the quality of what he writes about Irish history is absolutely extraordinary. Um, just to answer that by way of anecdote, the importance of history in understanding current international challenges and making a foreign policy is that it is the irreducible factor in those calculations already. It's not that you need a historian to come and tell people how to act or, or you know, m m to, to unlearn examples they had beforehand. I just, yeah, by way of anecdote, is, is in the State Department archives, which I've been looking through recently for a, a separate project, I found a discussion that Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon had a year to the day after Nixon's election as president. When he's reflecting on the moon landings, he's talking about a revolution or a change in British foreign policy and uh, in American foreign policy, and they talk about the books they're reading at that at that crucial moment in time. So, what does Nixon and Kissing, what are Ki Nixon and Kissinger reading together? They're reading H. G. Wells, Man on the Moon. They're talking about Teddy Roosevelt's use of the white man's burden, very, you know, a, a phrase that people are understandably allergic to today. This is 1969. The example of Britain in the late 19th century, early 20th century, faced with a threat in the form of Germany. They discuss this at great length. They also discuss Lord Castlereagh back in the 19th century. Then they go book to a book, which many of you will know, by Lawrence Thompson, um, a professor at the University of California at the time, a sinologist about, about 1940, about Britain's darkest hour. And, and, and Nixon and Kissinger reach for Churchill. And they reach for Churchill for precisely the purpose we heard about latterly, Churchill's um, later career, where he is this yearning for peace and order and stability, something that goes beyond immediate triumph. So it's not that you, as I say, not that you need a historian to say, you know, we must apply history or you've forgotten all the lessons, is that this is a living, breathing calculation. Obviously, at certain eras, without naming names, history looms larger in the consciousness of a president or a secretary of state in different, different eras, but it is, the, it is the, you know, a living, breathing historical force in all this era. It's there for Churchill. It's there for many, many thereafter. So I, th I think that's, that's the way to think about it. Thank you, Lord Bew. Thank you, Professor Bew.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so that you know, we are being recorded by C-SPAN this morning for a later broadcast. So as always, we are adhering rigidly to our timetable. Uh, before we go into our break, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, there is a set of um, placemats that uh, Barry Singer is selling that feature Churchill paintings, and there's 10 sets left, and the proceeds go to uh, the International Churchill Society. We will resume in 15 minutes. Thank you.